part of the difficulty uh, for us and for our readers is in some way we're, we're leading them to the mirror and saying, mm -hmm. this is the real Jewish community, um, not necessarily the one we like to think about, that uh, we are one and we only do wonderful things. This is Faith Complex, a dialogue about the entanglement of religion, politics, and art. Hello, my name is Jacques Rulitterblau of Georgetown University, and you're watching Faith Complex. Joining us today is the award-winning journalist and editor-in-chief and publisher of The Jewish Week, Mr. Gary Rosenblatt. Welcome to Faith Complex, Mr. Rosenblatt. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, it's the 10-year anniversary of one of your most famous pieces, one of your biggest contributions to Jewish journalism had to do with an Orthodox rabbi and, regrettably, a case of sexual abuse. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Sure. Uh, I think it's a familiar, all too familiar theme uh, these days of a member of the clergy who is abusing young people and turns out as being protected in some ways by the religious superiors, and um, in this case it was a rabbi who was the head of a national youth organization working with teens, and uh, remarkably he was accused uh, for over 30 years. Mm. These allegations were coming up from young people he was working with. What was his name? Baruch Lanner. I see, and the victims were generally 12, 13, 14 year old kids in his? Sometimes a little older. Um, but teenagers and uh, boys and girls, uh, different types of abuse. But uh, he's a brilliant rabbi, scholar, very charismatic. And uh, even some of his uh, victims have said that they went into Jewish studies and professional fields in Jewish mm -hmm. education partly as a result of his teaching. And you were the person who broke the story. Yeah, uh, one of the victims uh, approached me, this was back in 2000, and uh, I ended up spending about seven months interviewing uh, people. And again, if we're talking about 30 years, there were literally hundreds of, uh, of victims. And uh, ultimately he was uh, investigated, he was fired as a result of the article. Before, and. Uh, he was investigated and brought to trial and convicted and served a jail sentence. Now back then, the Orthodox Union, or the umbrella organization of Orthodox Judaism, if I understand correctly, pleaded with you not to publish the story. Is that correct? Well, it was more implicit. Um, I, obviously, in spending that amount of time working on the story, the people got wind of it. Um, I attempted to interview the, the rabbi himself, but uh, he he didn't want to talk with me, and um, spoke to his superiors but soon before the article ran. And um, uh, so there were sort of offers made at one point and said, well, we'll have them work with college students instead. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't feel that my role as a journalist was to, to make deals, or um, that wasn't my job. So we published the story. Dan Rather once said, report and be damned. That's my job. Is that your job? Well, so I had both. Um, you were damned. Uh, well, we reported. And uh, I have to say, in terms of the general readership of the paper, it was very supportive. I think they felt that we did uh, the right thing. But as I mentioned, in terms of some of the uh, rabbinic colleagues, there was uh, a reaction uh, Critical. And again, I think we're, you know, the undercurrent here is in relationship to the Vatican mm. Church scandal with priests. Um, in no way is it a kind of uh, proportional parallel. But in terms of some of the responses and reactions, it was blame the media. Mm. And, um, and the, the, you had the added. Uh, issue of Lashon Hara. Of, of, Translate uh, that for our viewers who might not well, know what Well, I, I guess it's a Jewish concept, a, a prohibition of, of spreading gossip. Mm. Every Jewish person I know spreads gossip. I don't know what Chafetz Chaim was thinking, but um, I spread gossip all the time. I'm not sure. Well, the Chafetz Chaim is a rabbi who is most famous for writing on the subject about a hundred years ago. And um, 
he, I think he had a very good insight into human nature because he said you're not only not supposed to speak badly about people in public, but you shouldn't say anything good about them either because mm. if you're in a group, then even if you don't, then somebody else will have something uh, to but pipe in. A journalist cannot live by the good rabbi's credo, apparently. Well, That's your I think if he was a publisher mm. of a newspaper, it might have had a weather report every day, but that might have been just about it. So. <laughs> But in fairness uh, and in fullness, uh, even the Chafetz Chaim, who's a great critic of Lashon Hara, um, had areas where he said it was permissible to uh, make distinctions, and that primarily was in terms of protecting the community. And uh, I don't know if you want to go into it, but uh, I did speak with a rabbinic authority before I published the story because I knew that somebody's career and life in many ways was at stake here. And uh, just briefly, the criteria that, uh, according to Jewish law, is to do whatever you can to prevent further harm. Mm -hmm. So the decision was ultimately mine, but the, the rabbi told me, I think wisely, he said, if there's any way you can prohibit this further action without publishing, then you should do it. But, but if not, he said, you're not only permitted to, but you're obligated to publish it. And don't you think it's a little odd to kind of look for uh, signposts about media ethics and halakha? I mean, it, it really is, the journalist is the modern creature par excellence, or, or one of them. Do you ever find that that's kind of a tension in your job, that, that Jewish halakha just doesn't really speak to the types of issues that you face here in the modern world? Well, I think the tension is always there. Mm -hmm. And um, whether it's a Jewish newspaper or maybe it, it's a, a little sharper in a religious community, but I think that that balance and that tension between uh, overstepping, uh, hurting people's personal lives unnecessarily, and doing what you think is is the greater good for the community, I think that tension is always there. So what was the reaction of your readers to your expose, uh, exposing something very, very difficult uh, and painful for the community to deal with? I think part of the difficulty uh, for us and for our readers is in some way we're, we're leading them to the mirror and saying, mm -hmm. this is the real Jewish community, uh, not necessarily the one we like to think about, that uh, we are one, and we only do wonderful things. So um, when readers uh, are confronted with uh, criticism or uh, difficult issues in, in, the, in the newspaper, uh, I, I think it's tough for them, and I understand that. But I have to say that the great majority of the response we got was very favorable. Hmm. It was uh, from the rabbis that we got the most grief. And what, what's the structural power? In a way, you presaged uh, the similar sexual abuse scandal, which is much larger in the Catholic Church. Is there something you learned in 2000 that when these stories broke a few years later in the United States on the Catholic side, you said, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Was yeah. there some institutional reflex that kept I, I think there is institutional reflex, and I think we see it, we saw it then, we see it now, uh, and uh, protect your colleague rather than the kids. Well, we've been speaking to Gary Rosenblatt, Editor-in-Chief of The Jewish Week. Mr. Rosenblatt, thank you so much for coming today. Thanks very much. Enjoyed it.